Lucas, you see Endgame? So, I haven't seen Endgame, and I haven't even seen episode three of Game of Thrones. I started my work term, so, uh, hey, change of pace, I'm busy. Uh, so, <laughs> unfortunately, I, I was planning on watching um, season, episode three of Game of Thrones on Monday, because I, I went to bed early on Sunday night. And instead, I went to a screening of the 90s film The Faculty at yeah, uh, the Museum of Natural History. Uh, yeah. And uh, listen, do I have to use Twitter less because I'm worried about getting spoiled? Yes. Mm. Uh, but was it worth it? Uh, absolutely. I highly recommend uh, any listeners check out The Faculty. What an insane movie. Never never seen it. But uh, you know what? If I If I get the opportunity, I'll scope it out. It reminded me about why I like Get Out so much, and it's that movies used to be fun and, like, creative, (laughs) and, like, people would just do dumb stuff, and, like, you'd be like, oh, what a silly idea for a movie. Aliens are taking over the faculty of this school and making them, like, killers, but it's actually, like, awesome. It's, like, so good. Right on, dude. I'm glad I'm glad that you had a good time. Okay, but I I needed to ask right up front, as we begin this new season... Yeah. Of the podcast, I needed to make sure, like, where we were both. Like, I just saw Endgame yesterday, okay. so I will refrain from any spoiler talk. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Elwood City Limits. As of right now, this podcast is in Endgame spoiler-free zone. Will, I haven't even seen the last one, to be perfectly frank with you. Well, well, that's not you. I, I, I feel in, like I saw it because I saw the memes. Yes. Like, I feel like the memes really filled me in. Like, I, I feel like I could tell you everything that happens in that movie. <laughs> but did I see that movie? No. Yeah. I, well, okay. So Infinity War is on Netflix now. So that's on, that's officially on you. I, I accept my punishment. I, 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 I yeah, that's, you're correct. Uh, so welcome again to Elwood City Limits. This is, if this is your first episode, welcome to season seven of Arthur as we are talking about the classic PBS Kids show, an episode by episode. My name is Will Young. I'm one of your hosts, and I'm the one who's seen Avengers Endgame. The one who hasn't is my co-host, Lucas Mancini. That's right. I, I've seen, you know, classics like Blade Two, but I have yet to see uh, the newest uh, uh, entry in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And you and I are going to be seeing something very important very soon. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Avengers Endgame, blah, whatever. Uh, Sure. Okay. Biggest movie in the world. Huge opening. Massive culmination of 10 years of cinematic universe. Yeah, 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 yeah. Two things we got to get out of the way. First of all, it's Detective Pikachu season, baby. It's officially Mm -hmm. Detective Pikachu season. You and I have our, uh, our moral duty. Uh, as put upon us by the Patreon subscribers, we're going to go see and review Detective Pikachu. We're getting but paid. We're getting paid to do we're that. We're getting. We're technically getting paid to go see Detective Pikachu. Uh, but also, okay. I mean, before we before we get to the but also, uh, I just want to I want to slide this in here real quick because I know what that but also is. That's a loaded <laughs> but also. Uh, so be- <laughs> So before before we before we get to that, I'll tell you exactly whom is going is waiting for us our exclusive Detective Pikachu Patreon episode, which is going to be coming out in just a couple of weeks. Here, I'm talking about Chandler Lefave Boten. I'm talking about Christine Wong, Crescent Fresh, Dan Mike Dawson Silva, Emily K, Froppy, Ian Collis, Jake ba- Jake Bailey, Joe Sue, John DeLong, John Griswold, Kalen Krogall. Kalen, sorry if I messed up your. Last name. It's been a, it's been a little while. Kevin Noon, uh, Leanne S, Light Relentless, Macy Ball, Riley Stevens, Ross Ward, Sam Solero, Stella, and Teresa. They are all awaiting our thoughts here. And now that but also. Okay, so Will, did you see the Sonic the Hedgehog trailer? Yeah, yeah, I did. <laughs> okay, so uh, this uh, I I I'm fully anticipating <laughs> this to go somewhere that I can't predict. Uh, okay, so my love of the Detective Pikachu trailer might be mistaken as irony, but I assure you that I truly, truly am really excited to see that movie, and I think it looks like a really fun time. Mm-hmm. The Sonic trailer, um, like, so not so much. Um, it, like, so it definitely doesn't look good. 
Um, but I also have to see that movie. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Like it's it's insane. Like that. Tra- <laughs> like it's not even just like okay, Sonic looks it's like ridiculous and awful. Like sure, whatever. But like the dialogue in that movie is bizarre. It is so weird. Like like the, 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 I I. It is so, it's like indescribable. Like I find myself trying to talk about like Jim Carrey, Jim Carrey's like conversation with that general. And it's like, I, I can't even like begin to conceptualize. Like, what were your thoughts? Uh, James Marston tries to shoot Sonic. I think it's been a literal decade or more since you could, you could accurately say that Jim Carrey might be the saving grace of a movie. <laughs> that's that, that that that's all might. We don't know just yet. I mean, obviously, I don't think this looks very good. I if you'll remember from previous episodes, I was not down for the Detective Pikachu trailer at first. Boy, does it improve when you put them, you know, back to back with one another. I can't wait to see Detective Pikachu now. Uh, well, like uh, Detective I'm, Pikachu, like if we really want to put our movie critic hats on, like Detective Pikachu. They did the ballsy thing of like, okay, we're going to make a Pokemon world. You know what yeah. I mean? Like they're committing to like the world building of like, okay, we're going to make Vol- like Viridian City or whatever, Mute City. Um, like the Sonic one, it's just like, it's just a cop out. It's like, okay, Sonic's in our world so that we don't have to make all these sets. Um, and he's buddies with a cop, which has nothing to like, you, if you wanted to do Sonic in our world, you could make it off Sonic X or whatever. But they, they made him friends with James Marston, and they also made him look insane. Um, but yeah, Jim. Yeah. Car- but Jim. Car- but Jim Carrey, though. I I I'm very positively curious about Jim Carrey's role in this whole thing, and I appreciate that he really seems to be giving it his all. I think that's what this movie needs is somebody to commit to the bid because, boy, like the re- the rest of it. Gosh, it just does not look like it. Just what's what's the word I'm looking like repulsing, <laughs> repulsive, uh, you know. But I'm also very afraid. I believe there was a point on our Elwood City Limits Discord. By the way, if you don't have, if you're a patron and you don't have your invite for the Elwood City Limits Discord, message me on Patreon and let me know. I just want to make sure everybody's in there. Uh, I was asking like, hey, uh, what are some more reward tiers we should do? And I forget exactly who it was. But somebody was like, uh, do a reward tier where you go see Sonic the Hedgehog. I'm afraid that if we put that up, that's going to happen. Oh, uh, Will, I was seconds away from being like, so we're doing the reward tier for Sonic the Hedgehog, right? Like, we're at mean, tw- we're at, when does Sonic the Hedgehog come out? We're at 21 now. No, November, I think. Oh, Will. I feel like 30 is too low. Do we want to do 35 for Sonic the Hedgehog? What are we thinking? It's, it, you know what? 30 is too low for me to see Sonic the Hedgehog in theaters. We're going to have to go. It's It's got to be above. Uh, I'll, I'll think of I'm something. Not going, but I'm not going 50. I'm feeling maybe 40 no, on this no, one. No. 35, 40. Yeah, we're we're going to we're going to shoot. We're going to aim high for this one. So if you want us, if you want me to. I'm already paying to see a Pokemon movie. I'm I'm almost 30, you know, like if you want me. It's true. In the, I, I, in the I, eve I, of my 29th year to see Sonic the Hedgehog in theaters, I will. But you have to come out. I uh, I saw you have to do this. I saw a tweet. I forget who it was from uh, that was talking about the the discourse online when the the Sonic trailer dropped, and he was like, I, I mm. picture myself in 1994 sitting on the floor and my dad coming home from work mad about what the Fraggles looked like in Fraggle Rock. <laughs> um, and that's kind of, I think that's a pretty good summation of, uh, what's it like being an adult and having <laughs> passionate feelings about the Sonic the Hedgehog movie. <laughs> well, it's going to keep happening, I'm sure. Well, and we also have passionate feelings about Arthur. So I think it's high time we get to that. Uh, I want, I also want to quickly, uh, we have a bit of a time limit here. So I want to quickly get to. Our feedback at ElwoodCityLimits at gmail.com. It's been building up since you and I, Lucas, we had a bit of a two-week break here. Right. And we're back in the saddle. So uh, as we are on the eve of the seventh season, we have a couple of correspondences here via email. First one comes in from Z. 
Looking forward to Season 7. The season will start off rocky, they say, but afterwards it will have gems including Waiting to Go, DW's Time Trouble, The World of Tomorrow, Is There a Doctor in the House, and more. Afterwards, and not to get ahead of myself, Seasons 8 to 10 will have more iconic episodes including the finale. So the best is yet to come, it seems, for us. Okay. Well, hey, I'll reserve judgment about whether the season started off rocky uh, until the end of this episode. So stay tuned for that. Stay Stay tuned. Next one is from Kevin, one of our patrons. Uh, First of all, congrats to Will for your wedding. Thank you very much. Hope it was a great ceremony. It was. I've started my yearly summer rewatch of Arthur, and I'm ready to tell you about one of my favorite yet underappreciated aspects of the show, and that's the portrayal of marriage. Arthur, as discussed, is excellent at showing different family types, such as Buster and his parents. However, even in the more nuclear families, such as Arthur's, they are careful to show a natural and healthy parental relationship. Jane and David were loving towards each other and weren't afraid to show signs of affection. Even when they did fight, they portrayed them as arguing in a healthy and adult way. Not getting too specific, my parents did not have a very positive relationship with each other. I have a very clear memory of watching Arthur as a kid and seeing Jane and David read. I can point to Arthur for helping me understand what adults and parents could be. Keep up the good work. That's a great point. I don't know if we've ever really touched on that, you and I, Lucas. I mean, we talked a little bit about, um, obviously, Buster and and sort of like really early on we touched on how Arthur shows off different uh, family dynamics and and different uh, uh, sit- living situations. So we kind of briefly touched on it, but I, I guess we never really talked about how um, Arthur's parents is is kind of a, a typical healthy relationship. Um, but I, I would tend to agree. Yeah, I'd, I'd almost call them marriage goals. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I think that's a, a very good point. A lot of the a lot of the parental nuclear ra- relationships. In the show, as uh, as Kevin said, are quite healthy, and we and we do have the benefit of Arthur's parents being a bit more under the microscope. So we did actually, you know, like in Mom and Dad have a great big fight. They do fight, but the severity of it is blown out of proportion by their kids, who are like actually stunned by the idea that their parents even fight at all, which is something to say in and of itself. I, Kevin, I know what you mean. Uh, I my my parents divorced when I was. Uh, uh, quite uh, when I was just starting high school, so I kind of understand what you mean. Uh, maybe not to the full extent. I don't want to assume, but I looking to fiction for um, kind of your more ideal uh, relationships in any regard. Uh, I'm glad that you could get it here from Arthur, and I'm glad that you brought that up. I think that's a very important thing to shout out for that show. We have another one here from Lion Dog ZXA, who also congratulates me for getting married. Thank you. Uh, For the Arthur Marathon, I voted for Arthur's Almost Live Not Real Music Festival, The Blizzard, and Sue Ellen Gets Her Goose Cooked. I think those are, yeah, that's what a great, uh, great choice of three. That's Mm. a, that's a triple feature if I ever heard one. On the topic of the episode, Crushed, I think the ice cream flavor, Chunky Skunk, is chocolate chunk ice cream with vanilla stripes. That's not bad. That's not bad. I didn't even think of that. Also, I have a bone to pick with you guys for quite some time. Ooh. In the episode where you discuss Meek for a week, you two talk about your hatred for cherry soda. I've got to ask you, what are your guys' problems? I love cherry soda. Did I say I hated cherry soda? That was like two <laughs> years. That was two years ago. I um, I really don't feel any type of way about cherry soda no. now. I, 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 God. I, I, guess, I, I, I guess, really I, don't remember I, this. I guess 2016 Lucas had some really hot opinions on cherry soda. Well, I, was it, who's this from again, David? Uh, Lion Dog ZX. Li- Lion Dog ZX, pretty close. Uh, Lion Dog ZX, you can rest easy knowing that um, I have gone from hating cherry soda apparently to not really caring about it either way at all. So I guess, it, hey, everybody's everybody's growing, everybody's... Uh, everybody's working on their own story. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I'm not a fan of cherry flavor, but I certainly don't begrudge anybody who is. So, Lion Dog, you do you. We're uh, we're happy to live and let live when it comes to soda. I'm excited for your reviews of a lot of the episodes in Season 7. As much as I'm excited for the review of Elwood City Turns 100, I'm much more excited for a review of Waiting to Go, a great Binky and Brain episode. Uh, thank you very much. Now, Lucas, our last one here is from Piano Hands One Two Three Four. I think you're really gonna like this. It's a Gen Z translation of the Arthur theme song. Ooh. So, uh, let me see if I can uh, 
it's it, it's a bit wordy, so I'm gonna try and do it on. Uh, let me see if I can also. I'll see if I can put the Arthur theme song. Well, uh, the show theme song behind me. Okay. Every day when you go high key down the street, oh. and everybody that you meet has a cringy point of view. Oh yikes! And I say facts, facts. <laughs> what a lit kind of day where you can learn to roast and play and get out of my lobby, noob. <laughs> You gotta be Gucci with your heart. Woke to the beat, floss to the rhythm, the rhythm of the street. Dab into your eyes, dab into your ears. You gotta yeet together and make things better to get that W by working together. It's a dope message and it comes from my fam. Chillin' yourself, chillin' yourself. Well, that's an odd flex, but okay, but okay. And I say facts, what a lit kind of day where you can learn to roast and play and get out of my lobby, noob. <laughs> wow. I love it. I love it. I high-key love it. Oh, oh my <laughs> word. Uh, this, is the, this is the youngest I've felt in some time. Uh, and somehow this is the oldest I've felt. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, uh, uh, I, I just uh, checked with Chief, and he told me, yep, that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Piano Hands One Two Three Four. Thank you, everybody, for your emails to ElwoodCityLimits at Gmail dot com. I've been banging this drum for a couple of seasons now. I don't like to be a nuisance about it. I would love if our show had its own theme song to any of our musically inclined listeners. I will say this. Oh no, I, I don't know if I yeah. can follow you on this journey. <laughs> if you can make a musical version of the Gen Z Arthur theme song and also make it the Elwood City Limits theme song. We'll consider making it the theme. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to put it through Lucas. Like we're like I you know, hate I'm not, listen. I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna override you. I'll I'm try. Not override you. I'll try anything once. <laughs> <laughs> or just try and, or, or just make an Elwood City Limits theme song for us. Um, I'm opening. You can send it to our email. Uh, send it to us on social. Uh, please and thank you. I would love us to have our own theme song instead of aping Arthur. So. Not not that that theme song is bad. Just I want our own identity, and I can't make music. So I'm looking to you, but no pressure. Okay, Lucas, it's time for Arthur Season 7. We're season getting ready 7. To... What a season, what a season. We're doing some quick facts here before we get into the actual episode. So Season 7 aired from October to November of 2002, uh, and we have some replacements in the voice cast, as no doubt you noticed immediately. Oh, I, uh, man, I, I don't think I did notice this immediately. Who's replaced? Are you, are you, are you kidding me? Is there a different Arthur or something? Are crazy? you, Lucas? Listen, you're I, not serious. I, I am. No, you're no. You're. Oh Here, my. Let me let me turn this audio on. Let me hear this again. Let's oh let's, take a, let's listen. Oh my lord, are you kidding me? Like, we stopped watching Arthur for two weeks and you forget everything. I mean, it has been two weeks. You have to give me a break. Okay, let's hear okay. this. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. All right, all right, all right. Okay, Arthur does sound different. <laughs> uh, I, I will, now that you pointed out, yes, Arthur is a, You watched this like half an hour ago. I, 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 I yeah. Um, Ooh, all right. Okay. So, let me, let me get to the voice changes here. First of all, this is one that we didn't hear. In this episode, we have a replacement voice actor for the brain. Thank goodness. Uh, Steven Crowder is out of here. <laughs> See ya. And uh, the new voice is Alex Hood, who I recognize as the voice of Kenny from Beyblade. There you go. Already, what an improvement. Uh, there, We have a new voice for DW, as we heard in this episode. Uh, Oliver Granger being replaced by Jason Swimmer. Oh wow! I didn't I didn't notice DW's new voice either. Though I did. I have a I, I have a lot to say about DW's new voice. It might not just be the voice of this episode, but yeah, we'll get into that. Uh, and finally, the big one, uh, Justin Bradley as Arthur. Uh, thank you very much for your service. Uh, Mark Rendell will be the new voice of Arthur for a few seasons. Uh, Mark Rendell, a Canadian actor known for he was in the movie 30 Days of Night. He was in an episode of Hannibal. He was the main character of the TV show Tales from the Neverending Story. Oh. And in fact, here's here's something interesting. You might recognize his voice from actually earlier in the show. Uh, Mark Rendell dubbed over Justin Bradley's voice for season reruns of season six. Whoa. Because 
I guess they just didn't like his kind of deeper voice for Arthur. As like, remember we went through the season yeah, last yeah, time, yeah, and yeah. Arthur's voice got deeper and deeper. His voice was kind of cracking. No, no, I remember, I remember. And finally, season seven won a daytime Emmy in two thousand three for outstanding sound mixing. Ooh. So keep an eye out for those sound effects. I mean, there's some pretty good banjo in this episode. Yes, there is. All right, the premiere of season seven here on Elwood City Limits. We're starting off with Castaway, and well, I, I this this hit me like a ton of bricks in the cold open. We immediately get into the two new major voice changes. It's a lot to take in at first. We get both Arthur and DW's new voice. Unless you're me, in which whoosh, <laughs> you're just it completely goes over your head. <laughs> so I mean, I was I maybe we'll have to do this in the next episode or something if you didn't really notice it. But I wanted to kind of give my thoughts here about the new voices. So uh, basically, Arthur wants to go to this new exhibit at the aquarium of like, you know, the most dangerous undersea creatures. And DW, as is the theme of the episode, really wants to go and basically uh, pesters Arthur into relenting and letting her come with him. Um, So Arthur's new voice is quite a bit higher pitched uh, immediately. Yeah, he sounds a lot younger. Yeah, which I like. I, th- I I prefer when Arthur has a bit of a younger voice. I not to not to put any shade on the previous two Arthur voices, which got deep near the end of their respective runs. Like I actually thought that that kind of helped the character feel like he was growing a little bit. But I think this is kind of like you know resetting Peter Parker as a high school student. It just kind of feels like, or at least a young person. It just kind of feels like Arthur's natural state is just kind of being this young boy. And I think Mark Rendell's voice is good. I I think also props to the voice actors where, you know, so many people have voiced Arthur at this point, um, but they all read as Arthur, whether the voice changes or not. Like, they all, you know, give a very... The the char- They don't change the character, even though the, the voice is changing. And um, that might seem simple, but it, there, it's definitely something to be lauded that, like, okay, like, yes, the voice is different, but, like, I don't know, Arthur's personality hasn't really changed. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I do. Um, none, nobody has felt out of place yet. We've had some voice changes here and there. They're like, oh, that's going to take a while to like get used to. It didn't take me long to accept Mark Rendell as the new voice of Arthur. And the same goes for Justin Bradley as well. It took less than less than half an episode for it to be like, yep, that's Arthur. So they, they usually do pretty well in picking uh, the kids for that one. Uh, Jason, Sh- Jason Swimmer as uh, DW... Not to say that DW's bad, but, like, what what an episode to debut a new DW voice in where it calls for her to be as whiny and childlike as she's ever been in, like, this entire series. It's like in the movie The Wrestler, how the very first scene Marissa Tomei filmed for that movie is the one where she gives... Uh, uh, the, the lap dance? The lap dance. <laughs> That was like the first day of shooting. Uh, that wow. this is if it, like I know this is not how they make TV shows, but like if this was like the first vocal performance was like, uh, yeah, we need you to play DW at her most shrill and most annoying. Um, like she, she, like she, she has literally ever been. I, we might as well get into this now. But yeah. DW in this episode often will sometimes will will play devil's advocate and sort of talk about this hypothetical person who like mm-hmm. we're always like okay mileage may vary with DW like me I feel like I'm more of a DW defender like I, I get a kick out of her whole shtick. Um, Same. This is probably the most I've been legitimately disliked like I've been legitimately annoyed by DW to the point where she had like X Pac heat. Where I'm like, okay, I, I just don't want to hear from DW anymore in this episode. I felt terrible for how I felt about DW this episode. <laughs> I was because they have her be essentially her most her most babyish. Like right here in this cold open, like well, it's not Arthur even says, it's not even babyish. It's more petulant, right? Like pet, you, yeah, petulant, sure. But like literally, there like here in the cold open, it's like Arthur's getting ready to go to the aquarium with his dad. He's like the whole theme of the episode is that he wants to have this outing just him and Dad Reed. But then DW is like, I want to come too. And Arthur's like, no. And then she just goes, but I want to go. And then it literally cuts from her to baby Kate, like s- crying. So the association we're meant to make is that DW is acting like a baby, which is which is strange because like we literally have seen DW at the most mature four year old in the entire world. So you can sometimes forget that she's still a very young child who 
would it, it makes sense that she would do this thing. It just kind of seems beneath her a little bit in a weird way. So they they go to this they want to go to this exhibit. DW wants to go to a unicorn exhibit, which is at the which is at the I guess it's at the museum actually, not the aquarium, like I said earlier. And DW again like cries and cries and then dad's like, Okay, I'll take her to go see the unicorns and Arthur, you go to see the fish and we'll be back in an hour. I have written and- down here, wow, this sucks. Like I just remember this initial DW tantrum, and it continues throughout the episode. But this ini- really this does. initial DW tantrum already was like, yeah, it's like you said, it's off putting in a way where we haven't really seen from DW before. Like it's like uniquely annoying. And again, like there's been moments with DW that are supposed to be annoying, like when she's like singing the Crazy Bus song in previous episodes over and over again. But for me, they've read as like like funny like kind of endearing yeah, I, I, I like yeah. i was enjoying how arthur was annoyed without being annoyed myself whereas here like she's annoying to the point where like i don't even like arthur's kind of being a little brat too like a little bit like but it's justified because dw's being so bad but arthur's being a little bit annoying as well but it's not even because i'm being annoyed for arthur i'm just annoyed by the character yeah and i mean this is again it's a kind of a tough situation to put this voice act this young voice actor into at the time it's just like He's doing a good job. Yeah, I don't think it's the. I think it's pure writing. No, it's yeah. It it no very very much so. I'm not blaming the voice. It's just like I'm really looking forward to when we can see uh, Jason Swimmer be the more the conniving, the mature DW. The like I'm looking. We only saw really one facet of the character here, and and I really hope that the, the actor's effectiveness in this role. Uh, carries over to the rest of DW. So I'm not holding that against them. It's just one debut is a bit more sterling than the other when comparing Arthur and DW. So uh, Arthur sort of starts Ferris Buellering at the camera while DW yeah. is off in the unicorn exhibit and he's exploring the deep creatures of the sea exhibit. And then he like turns into a Redditor for a second where he's like, little sisters are always ruining it for us guys. Like when yeah. for some reason, the term us guys, like it's just like nails on a chalkboard for me. Like, I don't think I've ever heard someone earnestly say us guy. Hey, I'm talking to the fellas here. <laughs> as a, as a man. Yeah. You know, I'm a real man's man. Me and the boys. Yeah. Uh, like any, any, like for, ugh, it just gives me the heebie jeebies. I know that that probably wasn't intentional. This was 2002. I don't think, like, kind of the rhetoric around us, you know, hey, ladies, this one's, this one's for the fellas. Uh, yeah. I, I don't think that kind of stuff existed. Well, it probably did, but it was just more acceptable. And I was like a little kid and I didn't understand that it sucked. But, uh, right. uh, yeah, that was kind of weird. Uh, so, the cold open actually continues into the episode itself where Arthur, where DW is talking about all the unicorns that she saw that day. Arthur is very annoyed and goes up to his room. Arthur uh, also, again, very much acting his acting his age here. He's just uh, we, we see kind of the the toll it takes of being DW's brother sometimes. So like we often see like DW being slighted by Arthur, I feel a bit more. So this is really the other way of just like, you know what? Being DW's brother is not the greatest thing in the world sometimes. So he really wants to do something with his dad. And so dad offers that they go on a fishing trip the next weekend. Just the two of them, no DW. Was there anything that you really liked to do with just you and your dad when you were young? Well, I mean, and I don't want to get too ahead of myself here, but something I really like about this episode is it did make me... uh nostalgic for me and my dad used to go camping together all the time like that was that was like our thing when i was younger um and it's funny because at the time i kind of hated it because i didn't really like camping that much i was just like i want to be home on my computer uh yeah. but now as an adult i i really look back on those memories fond like fondly that the father-son uh bonding time uh so that that is and that is something that, that that's like probably my favorite part of this episode is how it reminds me of that and we get this uh this dream sequence um, well, <laughs> well, okay. Before we get to the dream sequence, uh, Will, do you do you have any, uh, you know, Will and Dad uh, memories? Not especially. It was it was it was just more like my dad was a bit more athletic than I was, so he tried to make kind of sports and athletics kind of our thing, and I never wanted to do that. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't know if we ever really had a thing that connected like. Sorry, I know that sounds a little sad, but it's just like, yeah, we never really connected in mm. in in that way. It was kind of more 
me and my mom. So, but I, but I know that you're pretty close with your dad. So yeah. I, I wanted to hear, hear from you about that. And we still hang out like the nowadays that thing is like watching the fights. Like me and my dad are both kind of into MMA together. And, and like, mm-hmm. I, I like you wasn't really ever into sports as a younger kid. Um, I've only like kind of grown to love, you know, basketball and MMA, like as I've gotten older. Whereas when I was a kid, my dad was always trying to get me into hockey and I never really liked it. Um, but so now we, we kind of bond over those things as well. And I, I think about that stuff fondly. But yeah, so speaking of fond memories with your dad, Arthur has this dream sequence where he's fly fishing with his dad and he like pulls up a comic, like like the biggest fish you would get in Animal Crossing times 10. Like he pulls up this like comically large fish. It's like yeah. it's like the fish from the balloon fight map that comes when you get too close <laughs> to the water. And yeah, I think I caught this. I think I caught this fish in Breath of the Wild. Yeah, yeah. And then um, what ends up happening is th- we have a really great visual gag where uh, the fish is pulling Arthur, and Arthur's dad has a camera ready to go, and he starts like snapping pics of his yeah. son being pulled away. <laughs> that got a chuckle out of me. And then another thing that really made me laugh. This is almost like an adult swim joke. This is a really weird visual gag, actually, is that when Arthur pulls the fish on to, like, land, it, like, vomits up a bunch of other fish, (laughs) which is, like, not a joke I would expect from Arthur. That's kind of grotesque, but very funny. Uh, it was a bit. It was a bit off the wall. Now that you mention it, and while all this is happening, DW, and you want to talk about annoying DW voice? This is like DW is already like unlistenably annoying in this episode and this is them trying to intentionally be even more yes. like up to 11 annoying because it's a fantasy sequence dw is like calling like arthur's dad on his cell phone and arthur's dad at first like wants to give her a little bit of attention but then like while this giant fish is like flying around he like drops the cell phone in the water and like this is again arthur's dream sequence so he's like seeing this as like a really like oh arthur's dad like does not care about dw pestering him um all this stuff uh, and so that that's essentially that imagination sequence. At one point, uh, Arthur's dad's like, DW, who? Yeah, that's how it literally ends. There's also a great read here from, uh, uh, well, Bruce Dinsmore, actually. It's um, when DW calls dad and, you know, you can hear it kind of on the other line. She's like, daddy, it's DW. I, I miss you. And I'm just a little girl. Duh. And then dad just goes, Oh, poor DW. <laughs> and it's it's that dumb voice that Bruce Dinsmore yeah. puts on sometimes in like the dream sequences. Arthur, Ar- Arthur's that, mom that does it a voice. lot too, where it's like, I, like yeah. the, whatever the kids see. Oh God, I just saw the fish again when it like coughs up all the other fish. Yeah. It's so it's like too fast, like the animation of it, like the fish just come out too quickly. <laughs> It, it it is it is an adult swim joke. That's a very good pull. Um, yeah, I kind yeah I kind of like this this dream sequence. But yeah, boy, you're not kidding. The, when the, the, this actor really succeeds in making DW annoying, and we have a bit more of that here as Arthur and Dad are ready to leave for the trip, but Dad has to answer a phone call, and it turns out that the next week, the one af- the weekend after this, he has to do a catering event, which means that he won't get to have a weekend with DW and of course which she whines and cries she's just like I don't win I, 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 I'm sorry I, I, I won't <laughs> uh, if, if you've seen the episode you've already been punished enough um, but yeah she continues to whine and cry and Arthur finally acquiesces and just is just kind of like silently is like okay like she can come and DW comes with them on the fishing trip uh yeah it's, it's it's right here i wrote good god this is the most annoying dw has ever been so that's a uh, lasting memory from this on the ride here this is where it kind of t- started to turn into like almost like an episode of stressed eric where like everything is going wrong for arthur and because dw uh, dw's like can we listen to my mary moo cow tape and arthur's like no please i've given you everything please just not mary moo cow and so they start to listen to henry screever and the cauliflower queen which is a book on tape, but then the book on tape uh, unravels, which is not, which is remember when remember when we had tapes and they could unravel. I know, and this is two thousand two too. Like, get a CD right guys. right at right at the end of tapes. I guarantee you. And then, the, so they have to put in Mary Moo Cow. So again, it's this is just kind of torturous for Arthur at this point. And as a matter of fact, it can get even worse. Dad has this kind of vision of bringing Arthur to this place where he used to go with his dad. It's this place called Whale Lake. Uh, I looked it up. There is a Whale Lake in Cook County, Minnesota. So I don't know if they go all the way to Minnesota, but 
there is a actual whale lake. And it's a, so it's a bit different than what dad remembered because they get there and it's like they see the parking lot. Uh, it takes them a while to find where they're actually trying to go. But it's a spot where dad and his dad used to go fishing and he wants to teach Arthur how to fly fish. So they get there. They're, he's trying to teach Arthur how to fly fish. It's not going exactly well, but it looks pretty hard. I've never been fishing in my life, and specifically, like, the whole casting method thing with fly fishing, like, again, reminds me of the fishing mini game from Ocarina of Time. It's <laughs> very, very hard to master. Yeah, I, I, you'd have to practice a lot with, like, the Dreamcast fishing controller to get me uh, uh, properly fly, <laughs> fly fishing out here. And Arthur seems to have some difficulty with it too. He can't. Uh, he keeps um, pulling it back too far and, and and hooking it on. He hooks it on his dad's hat. He hooks it into the tree. And then the one time he casts it properly, he lets go of the fishing rod. And they kind of spend all day doing this. Um, and then when Arthur goes to re- retrieve the fishing rod, he slips on the wet rocks and sprains his ankle. Was it his ankle or was it his knee? No, no, it's it's definitely his ankle. It's his ankle. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the, I also want to mention here another kind of weird offbeat joke is that like they eventually find you know where they're supposed to go, D- and DW is like, look, there's like a carousel kind of thing, and Dad's like, don't worry, it's like we'll have plenty of time for stuff, just the two of us, and then there's just this shot of this young little rabbit kid who touches this car, and the car alarm goes off, and he's like, ah, oh my and goodness, I, I completely missed this. It's, it's, oh, it, I see it now. Weird. It, it's really strange. I don't really get what the joke is, but it's just like, what a, what a strange thing to include. They're not exactly completely successful at fly fishing, but they've got a couple of days to do it. And if, so Arthur's not as amazing at it as he thought that he would be right off the bat. So, yeah, Arthur hurts his, hurts his leg, and so he has to kind of stay behind and rest, which he... Kicks back in a hammock and is just like, man, this is awesome. Well, so, then so at first out, he's like yeah. not so sold on the idea because DW really wants to go, and Arthur is like kind of bitter and he like doesn't like the idea of DW having fun with his dad. But also DW's being so annoying. It's like actually maybe it's better if I just rest and DW's off with dad. So he kind of grew, the idea grows on him, and he sees he's sitting in the hammock. He's like, oh, you know what? This isn't so bad. Just like being near the lake, relaxing. No DW. Um, and then who comes back but DW, and she's a savant. She's a master uh, a fly fisher. Which I really – so there's a couple things here that I liked. It's, it turns out that apparently fish are really attracted to the Mary Moo Cow theme song, which DW has on a boom box. So they, Dad says they were practically leaping into the boat. Um, it reminds me of a very old Strong Bad email <laughs> where he uses uh, the lure and jig, where it's like, how a – how about you use one of your lures, strong man? <laughs> yeah. And he's just like, uh, fish, fish, come up here. I got s-. And then it's just like, how about uh, you try a jig there? And then he just goes, come on, get in the boat, fish, fish. Come on, get in the boat, fish, fish. So that's what that reminded me of. <laughs> um, I also really liked here, so there's a bit of continuity as Arthur's like, but I thought you, like, he's essentially like, I thought you hated the fact that, like, l- like you thought you hated fishing because of like dead fish. Cause if you remember the last time they went camping with DW's dear friend, like they caught a fish and she was like, poor thing. They had to give it a funeral and DW immediately forgets that she hates dead fish because she's go- so good at fishing. Right. So, so, okay. The funeral episode, what episode was that? Cause I remember watching it, but I don't remember doing an episode about it. That was a, that was a second season episode. It was very early on. Okay. I think it was, again, we're talking like, Probably 2016. Oh my goodness gracious. We've been doing this a while now, huh? Hey, hey Lucas, you can check out all of our back episodes with your favorite podcast provider. Oh. It's like, believe it or not, we've been doing this for almost three years, so we can't remember everything. Uh, yeah, I know. It feels like for it feels like forever ago. So yeah, DW is, is really good at fishing, so she doesn't mind looking at dead fish anymore, which I thought was actually really funny. Arthur's a little dismayed by that, but he's just like, oh, it's all right. Uh, we'll tr- we'll try again the next day, and it turns out the next day it rains. So Arthur, again, very determined to get the most out of this little vacation, uh, decides to go fishing in the rain, but uh, doesn't doesn't really go so well uh, because even the fish the fish have little umbrellas underwater <laughs> because it's that bad out. And they get back to the camp, and it turns out that DW has passed the secret of Mary Moo Cow onto everybody else who uh, went fishing. And we all get a group rendition of 
the Mary Moo Cow theme song, which is one guy is really like screaming it. This is actually where we get Arthur's breaking point. Like he's so frustrated that everything has turned out okay for DW and it seems like everything has gone wrong for him and he just he's just like, I can't take it. And he just has himself a little vent. He just goes off and feels sorry for himself. And I actually like that. I appreciate that. We what well, we've seen we've seen Arthur's breaking point with DW before, unfortunately, to the point where he's like hit her. But it's like we often see Arthur being annoyed by DW as kind of a joke, and this is just like this is the last straw. Like he he's been through a lot this episode. No, it's it, like for a second here that we get this shot of Arthur looking out over the lake, and I thought he was gonna walk into the lake and just like, <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> whoa, not not, not not like. Not, 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 not come out, but just like he just looks like he wants to walk into the lake. Yeah, he looks, he looks ready to go for a walk. But jeez, the implications there, and it's like it makes sense. Like he's an eight-year-old kid, and and he just keeps this is this is the end of his rope, and so you know, dad kind of. The, so the point of this episode is that Arthur, he, he bent and he bent to DW, which is something that not a lot of people would do. So Arthur was very unselfish in a lot of ways, and I think that that does, in a way, speak to his character. Even though it ended up making him feel pretty powerless, um, I think it is a good thing to focus on. And we kind of wrap up the episode here with um, a callback to earlier in the episode. It's called Whale Lake because apparently a whale lives in the lake somewhere, but uh, dad and his father looked for it and they could never find it. And then all of a sudden, as they're going to leave, Arthur spots the whale and shows his dad as like the whale preaches. And dad is beside himself. He's so excited. He's just like, I've been looking for that whale for my whole life. And Arthur spotted it. So Arthur does get his little, his little moment to shine here. And again, kind of speaking to Arthur's character, like DW is like, but I want to see the whale. And as they're driving away, the whale breaches again. Arthur kind of taps her shoulder and points it out. And it's like, he didn't have to do that. Like he's, he's probably still pretty upset with DW. So he could have been, could have been kind of crappy about it, but no, he, he wasn't. So it kind of, it's, it's kind of, it's almost a bit, a bittersweet ending where like a lot of Arthur had to go through a lot of crap Mm -hmm. and he did get something in the end, but it might not feel proportionate depending on how you feel. It reminded me of the episode in like season one where they go to the beach. Just a little dash of magical realism at the end there too. The fact that this this yeah. this this folklore whale actually was uh, at the lake the whole time. And now a word from us kids. Oh yeah, it's back, baby, with all the Massachusetts accents you could want. <laughs> Were there a lot of accents here? I don't know if I clocked them. Oh, yeah. So there's a lot of kids from the the New England Aquarium, which is an aquarium that I've been to. uh, Mm. And they're going on a whale watching tour, which is old hat where me and you live, Will, here in in Nova (laughs) Scotia. Yes, I wrote down, I remember going to the harbor several times on school trips for various reasons. Yeah. um, In some place, like if you're from Arizona, I assume a whale watching tour is... Pretty much the most entertaining thing you could ever do because it's just, like, insane. Because you're just like, I've never seen the water, let alone a whale. Uh, but here, uh, uh, we we see a lot of whales. What we don't see is uh, a lot of amazing kids like we have in this video. I have lots of quotes written down. It's been a while since we saw one of these. And boy, do these kids come out in rare form. We have, uh, it's, a uh, <laughs> they, they all, yeah, it... It was a finback whale. It was the baby. It was the calf. Very matter of fact. Like, this kid desperately trying to explain to the cameraman, like, how important this is. Like, yeah. you don't understand. It's, it was the finback whale. And then uh, another kid's like, it came right, right up to the boat. You don't see that every day. There was a terrific comedy cut where it's like they're asking, like, the, the people behind the camera clearly asking kids, like, what is a whale? And one kid goes, a whale is a fish. Cut to another kid who just shakes his head. <laughs> yeah, he's like, no, it's a mammal. They drink milk. Which I, I always, I remember the egg classification. Maybe this shows how long I've been outside of the public school system. I always, mm-hmm. I, I always remember that, like, obviously mammals do not lay eggs. But I always forget that the, it's a unique mammal thing to drink milk. We also hear from the tour, the tour guide on the ferry that they're on. And just like, oh, look, it's a finback. We don't normally see finback calves. And I was like. Sure you don't, lady. Sure you don't. You gotta you gotta spice it up for everybody 
on the tour here, but it's like, sure, you don't see the calves, whatever you say. <laughs> you know, I got to make it exciting for the <laughs> tourists. So, yeah, it, it, it was a little bit of a nice flashback to my own school days of going on a whale watch or on the Blue Nose 2 or something. All right, and now a word from us before we get to the second half of the episode. Hi there, Elwood City Limits listener. Just a quick note here from your buddy, your pal, Will Young, that this show is supported by all of you listeners just like you by the following ways. Facebook.com slash Elwood City Limits. Twitter at ECL Podcast. Tumblr, ElwoodCityLimits.tumblr.com. And Instagram at Elwood City Limits. Drop us a line on social media. We'd love to hear from you and give us a like, a heart, whatever it is. Email ElwoodCityLimits at gmail.com. You can get your email read here on the air. Just send it to us and uh, let us know what you think of the episode, of the show, of anything in particular that we might have talked about or that's on your mind. And you can find the podcast by going to ElwoodCityLimits.Libsyn.com and you can find it at your local podcast provider. Now, if the show is not on a service that you use all the time and you you'd like to change that, make sure to drop us a line and we will get it on there as soon as possible. All right, let's get back to the episode now, already in progress. And now, back to Arthur! And we're back. Well, Lucas, it was going to happen one way or the other. It's time for another Kate and Pal episode yeah. with the great sock mystery early in the season i like i was really surprised that it was a kate and pal episode already i was like geez did we just have one of these in fact it's a, a rather unusual beginning for one of these it's a like a horror movie opening uh but with almost almost like a friday the 13th where it's like we're getting the the killer's point of view except it's uh, uh an animal who has wandered into the reed house in order to do something nefarious that we never quite see. Yeah, it's like Agent 47, he tosses the mouse, and uh, Arthur's <laughs> mom is like, what was that? And she walks out up the stairs, uh, and, the- and, and then they kind of look at the sock, and it's like the great sock mystery. I didn't put it together that the that uh, the per, the perpetrator used like a distraction. Like he just kind of flicked a coin. Yeah, exactly, like, exactly. Huh? huh? What was that noise? Yeah, so we get right we get into right away the Kate and Pal of it all. DW has lost a sock, and uh, this is what Kate and Pal are essentially tasked with for the episode is finding the missing sock. DW we, we DW uh, immediately blames Arthur. Uh, she's like. She's like, he probably stole it to use as ear warmers for his crazy dog. <laughs> um, we kind of gave our thoughts on like, hey, the weirdness of Kate and Pal talking. So we won't really dwell on that here. Um, Pal decides to go searching for the sock. Did you yeah, notice? D- the DW's acoust- in, in hysterics. She's like, and my foot's cold as if she can't like just put another sock on. <laughs> And it, it's it is a very good dramatic DW, just like and my foot's cold. <laughs> like great job by the new voice actor. Um, Pal goes on a search for the sock. Uh, did you notice the nice acoustic track that we got when Pal was l- poking around? Ooh, no, I didn't. That audio Emmy, they're they're earning it already. It sounded really good. I did notice, uh, however, Pal eats lint, and he's like, "Mmm, lint," and it's like supposed to be a joke. Like, I'm a dog. I'm someone who lives with a dog right now. I should probably know this. Yeah. Is that like a thing that like dogs like lint to eat? Like, it, is that like a like a like? Oh, they chase the mailman and they eat lint. Like, is that a thing? Your guess is better than mine, dude. I, I'm not really sure how dogs work. Anyway, so Pal eats the lint and then he uh, kind of discovers a clue as to the the perpetrator. He finds a, a hair, uh, a white hair. That's right. Well, it's like you know, it's a brown hair, I think. Or- is it a brown? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yes, yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's what it leads into. So the, their immediate uh, suspect is Nemo, Francine's cat. And uh, Pal kind of drags Arthur to go over to see Nemo and confront him, essentially. Again, l- love Nemo's oh my human gosh. voice. It's it's so oily. Nemo, the, the character of Nemo is like, it has entered the, the Ratburn and... Binky Rubicon of my favorite Arthur characters. Like I love, wow. like, yeah, yeah. I love Nemo to pieces. It's just so my thing. Um, great moment with Nemo here. Um, we get this confrontation where Nemo uh, is talking about. I'd say, look what the cat drag did, but I didn't get to drag you in, pal. 
<laughs> and then Pal kind of gets set off and chases Nebo, and then Nebo straight up reenacts the um, come get y'all juice vine and runs head first <laughs> into the stove. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a, that's great. I didn't even think of that. Rubs a bunch of oil. Yeah, on I wish I could remember their names because she says the kids' names. Ken and Colin, run in here, get y'all juice. <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> but, great call. But back. then uh, 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 Pal realizes it's actually not Nemo's hair because Nemo has black and white hair, and it's a brown hair. And Nemo's like, "Pal, are you colorblind?" And Pal's like, "Actually, I am." Yeah, he's like he's like uh, Jeff Gerstmann, Vinnie Caravelli, exactly. he's colorblind. So they rule Nemo out as a suspect based on that. Uh, some great time with Nemo here. Then we go back to the garden. This holy yeah. shit! It's Toadie. Yeah, this is a WrestleMania moment. Toadie's back. <laughs> Toadie's back, baby. I I was hyped for this. Like. Listen, Will, no matter how you feel about Tony, no matter how the <laughs> listeners at home feel about Tony, like, if you've been listening to Elwood City Limits from the jump, if you've been watching these episodes of Arthur along with us, you know how big of a deal it is that Tony's freaking back, baby. Tony's back, yeah. Tony's a part we, of the art. He's a like Tony is officially like an Arthur character. Oh, so yeah. T- uh, so Tony is uh, talking to Kate and just uh, uh, Kate and Pal in the yard and just talking about how. Uh, he? I think is is Tony. No, he? Tony's a girl, actually. I believe Tony's a girl. Okay, excuse me. Uh, Tony's talking about how she heard, um, something breathing heavy in the um, in in the garden the other night, which is when DW's sock got stolen. Yeah, it, you know, it was. This is wild. Like, if you this is this episode goes all the way back to season one, where it's like we had the one episode with Tony, and I'm <laughs> like, boy, oh, like my, boy. Yeah, my dog's really excited about Tony coming back too. It's crazy. And it's just like, boy, this su- like this sucks because Toady is never going to be like a character anymore. And right away it's like Toady saying like, yeah, like after I got away from DW. So like th- there there you, there you go. Yeah, I know. To- Toady's back. Yeah, we we get a little bit of world building, a little bit of lore that uh Toady actually like escaped from DW but also did not move back with the other toads, stayed in the backyard cuz Toady hates the pond scene. The pond scene, my god! Uh, yeah, so I, I was I was floored by this. I completely forgot about it. I feel like we've had some listeners who have let us know that, like, hey, Toadie's Toadie will be back. But I, I was kind of like, I'll believe it when I see it, and I'm seeing it, and I still and I can hardly believe it. <laughs> so there you go. And and Toady is not just here for a one off. Toadie's back later. Ooh, that's uh, exciting. So so they decide to have a stakeout so Pal can wait for this uh, perpetrator. So he steals. Uh, Kate's baby monitor and brings uh, some donuts with him on a stakeout. This kind of um, I don't think I was big on like the other Kate and Pal episode but the part where Pal's gathering up supplies for the stakeout kind of reminded me of help me see the, the Toy Story quality to these types of episodes where it's like stories on a smaller scale where it's like obviously they're just looking for a missing sock but it's like I guess that's the appeal to younger kids it's like there's a secret world you don't know about just like how the fact that toys were alive in Toy Story really, really appealed to me as a young boy. Yeah, like, we get into this a little bit later, but, like, this episode does so much for the world building of the Kate and Pal episodes. Like, th- th- I think that's actually the role of this episode, and that's what makes this... I don't want to get too ahead of myself, but that's what I like about this episode so much, is that um, the, 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 the things we learn about this pet society... Uh, just adds so much life to this. It's this whole other aspect of Arthur that we haven't even like seen or heard of until now. No, exactly. And if and like if we're gonna keep doing this, we might as well like flesh it out a bit more. And you're you're right in that they do do that. I forgot about a line that Pal says during the day uh, where they find evidence of where the perpetrator has been in the garden. Pal says, "What if it's a raccoon or a tibble?" <laughs> That's a, that is a like, really good line. I like that. So it turns out that Pal does find out the perpetrator. It's actually Amigo. Who I didn't the, expect, uh, by the way. I was like, once it was revealed it wasn't Nemo, I like c- could not figure out for the life of me who this uh, the perpetrator was. And usually the Arthur, whenever they do a mystery, you can kind of see it from a mile away. So I, I was glad that I, I was tricked. I was bamboozled. Uh, Kate's got a great line. She's like, to think his name means friend. <laughs> And yeah, so Amigo is the one who's been stealing the sock, but it's not because he's 
for any villainous intentions. No, it's uh, well, well, let's get into it. It's um, he is a... okay. So oh boy, when oh when boy. I'm, when Amigo says this, I audibly gasped. I like almost fell out of my chair. What, this was might it be when the craziest. S- like this is one of the craziest Arthur episodes I've ever seen because Amigo explains to Pal. That he's a part of an yes. ancient secret society called the Fur Masons. If this were ten, y- if this episode were ten years later, it would be it would definitely be the Fur Illuminati or something. I mean, it's still kind of same. Like, it's still crazy. Anyway, yeah. So the Fur Masons, yeah, uh, they do a bunch of stuff. Like they invented killing mice. Like it, the Fur Masons is basically a society that uh, uh, it's it's they ch- they train dogs to help blind people. Yeah, yeah. That wasn't something that we did. It was the Fur. Masons the whole time. Anything that animals do for people, it's because of the fur masons. And so, uh, man, they also uh, steal socks. This is like the biggest thing that animals do. Um, and so, uh, Amigo takes Pal to this like secret society, like full bolted door. You need a passcode to get in. And then we see like this whole like it's like a speakeasy with all these dogs, um, and they're doing the sock market. So it's like a boiler room. This- or something, uh, yeah. and um, there is the uh, the green span. And at this point, I wrote this episode of rules. Uh, and then there's uh, <laughs> the green spaniel uh, with glasses. Mister Mister Mi- Green Spaniel. Mister Green yeah. Spaniel. Which will is this a parody of something? So it's a parody of an American economist named Alan Greenspan, which is like, hey, kids, ask your grandparents who Alan Greenspan is. Like, this is one for parents in 2002 where it's like the joke is is that he's boring. <laughs> uh, so, like, man, yeah. what a reach for that so one. So the, the Green Spaniel gives a explanation of why they do this. And, boy, howdy, like, I was – I'm not, like, complaining. I'm not, like, uh, I'm not trying to be, like, cinema sense and be like, ding. Oh, uh, that doesn't actually make any sense. Ding. Um, I'm more so pointing out how absurd it is because I think it's really, really funny. But the reason they're stealing the socks is so that humans will buy more socks to stimulate the economy. <laughs> <laughs> so strange. And he does that in that dry voice. And the point is that, like, you're not even supposed to understand him. It's just like, yeah, animals just do this. Well, no, no. <laughs> so he says it in his, like, really, like, the joke is that, like, nobody understands what he's saying because he's, like, a Borg economist. Right. But then uh, Amigo literally does say, we do it for the economy, which is, like, <laughs> insane. And then, it, like, we get all these lines about, like, Pal's like, I'll do it. I'll play the sock market. And at this point, my head this- is, like, spinning. At this point, I'm like, like, sometimes we describe Arthur episodes as, like, Lynchian, but this is weird in a completely different way. This is Hideo Kojima type of weird. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. It is. It's it's like Hideo Kojima and like a little bit of like I don't know. Again, to bring back Adult Swim, it reminds me of like Harvey Birdman, Attorney at Law humor. Like it's mm-hmm. just it's very strange, and I I am here for it. Uh, so Pal is trying we- to trade up to get the sock back, uh, and then he makes a series of bad deals. We get this montage of sort of this <laughs> bar graph, and and he gets a somewhat good sock, but then he gets a really bad sock, and then eventually he trades all the one of every sock in the reed household away uh mm-hmm. but then amigo finds a private investor who is willing to uh make a, a sock for non-sock trade so pal gathers everything of value uh that's lost and what a spread this is we got five Let, okay uh, I, I just want to say before we get too deep into it i've been saying and i continue to say i want arthur to get weird regardless of my feelings in this episode talking about it here um yeah no i'm i'm i want arthur to be this level of weird again though so it's, getting... it's weird in a way that it hasn't been weird before like when arthur has gotten weird it, it's been like lynchy and weird where it's like okay do you remember the purple surreal the, the purple elephants yeah. and all that stuff like like yeah the pink ele- yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah here on planet schmelephant this is not that type of weird at all this is like it's just strange <laughs> like i don't know how to describe yeah like a, a, a dog, a show with talking, and anim- it's the animals of the anthropomorphic animals um, yeah. who can talk, but the anthropomorphic animals can't understand them. And they have a secret society where they trade socks to stimulate the economy, and there's also a dog who's a parody of an economist. Like, when you explain it like that way, it sounds, in- like, insane. <laughs> And and to and to what you were setting up earlier, Kate and Pal find some household items that they can trade to their private investor, who is another toad who like has a 
an older like wiener dog as a as as a means of conveyance. He he has a hot dog in his mouth, which is meant to invoke like a cigar, and he talks like kind of like Lionel Hutz from The Simpsons. His name is Mister Toad, and he's like. It's like, how you doing there, kids? Mr. Toad's the name. What are we going to trade today? You know, it's like a real huckster kind of voice. It's like, who thought of this? Like, where does this come from? And then we just get a series of jokes. Like, we just, like, when, when Kate's trying to trade all these items, like, first they try to sit, trade five bucks. And he's like, I got a lot of that at the Crosswires house. I use it as wallpaper. That's like, that's a good yeah. joke. And then we, they try, the best is when they try, there's a woogle. Okay, call back to the Woogles, and Kate tries to trade that, and he's like, that fad went out with the 90s! And it's like, okay, yeah. so, like, the Toad knows about the <laughs> Like, the whole thing's ridiculous. There's a lollipop. Pal eats the lollipop. Uh, and then he wants to trade Pal. He wants Pal to be traded into indentured servitude uh, for yeah. the sock because his dog's getting old, and he needs a new one. Exactly. So, you know, they they kind of considered for a little bit, and who should come in but making her return? Well, Toadie. So Kate's not really falling for it, though, because uh, we get Mr. Toad has a great line where he goes, Come on, baby, he's not even your species. <laughs> uh, yeah, but we have Toadie coming in here who recognizes him as Mr. Toad, and they kind of... Uh, there seems to be a little something there. You could read into it what you want. Could be a friendship, could be a romance. Uh, but clearly they have some history together and they kind of leave to go catch up. It's actually kind of cute. I liked it. Yeah. Uh, and then and it's, the old it's a, dog. You know what? It's a, yeah. it's an ex, it's a deuce ex machina to like solve the problem. But, uh, I liked it. I liked it as well. I thought it was, again, more Tony, the better. I'm still in shock that Tony's back. <laughs> Me too. Like, are we going to get, uh, like, Arthur's uncle? Is he going to show up? Like, is Francine's neighbor? Like, now we have to go back through the list of the throwaway characters of the week because any of them could ascend to being a regular character at this point. I think I think at this point anything is possible and never say never in the Arthur universe. If Toadie can come back, I'd say anybody can, except maybe Spanky, but you never know. I'm sorry, Spanky's ghost. <laughs> yeah. Like, like maybe sometime deep in season 12, they were like, I don't know, Spanky. Like, that was her idea. Um, yeah, and the old dog that is uh, Mr. Toad's chariot, essentially, uh, just gives him the sock back. And that's essentially the end of the episode. I kind of forget the series of lines that Kate and Pal kind of end on. Uh, Pal's like, oh, okay, would you have traded me away? And Kate's like, no. Oh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah, that's the that wraps up that incredibly strange episode. <laughs> For better or worse. Uh, all right, that's the debut of Arthur Season 7. Let's wrap it up here. Uh, Lucas, what were your feelings on the episode Castaway? So, again, I have mixed feelings about it. I think I kind of didn't like it. Um, okay. There's nothing ineffective. Uh, like, the I, I did get nostalgic for hanging out with my dad, and I, I did understand what they were going for, but DW is too... It's just too annoying. Like at some point when it's like thing after thing where it's like Arthur's so excited to go on the weekend trip with his dad and then it's like oh he's gonna have to work the next weekend and DW like de like throws the tantrum and it's like from that point on that's like the rest of the episode is DW throwing a tantrum and it's just so annoying that I just didn't want to watch it anymore like straight up X-Pac heat like I, I again I get that the it was purposefully annoying for the purpose of the story to make us like feel bad for Arthur and 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 crave for him to have this special moment with his dad but i think it was just a little bit overkill to the point where i didn't like the episode very much and also it's My, just yeah. like i didn't really have a lot of notes for that episode because that's kind of all that happens um mm -hmm. so i did like the conclusion like you said like the moment with the whale and also arthur's kind of redemption of still tapping dw on the soul shoulder you're you're right that's a really incredible detail um and i think that really almost saves the episode uh, but yeah, I, I wasn't a fan. I'm a little bit more positive toward it than you are, but boy, my love for DW has never been tested high, harder than it was in this episode. I have to agree with you there. Um, they really went all out to kind of make her, and not even to kind of villainize her, but just, it was more for the sense of putting Arthur through all of this tribulation. And I'm not really a big fan of that in fiction. I'm not a big fan of, um characters you like going through like setback after setback after setback because eventually it gets to the point where it's like there's so many that happen against Arthur that in the end when you have so much time to wrap it up it's like it it it, it feels unequal it's just like Arthur went through all this garbage and then kind of got a little bit of redemption at the end but it didn't feel like enough um 
yeah, so they had to make, I again, great job to the new voice actors, I think. But uh, DW here is going to be a, a flashpoint for a lot of people. And if you thought she was too annoying, like, so did we. And it, it kind of stinks. So I'm ready for us to get back to the DW we love so that we can f- more appreciate the talents of this voice actor. The episode itself, I think it actually did a pretty good job of illustrating Arthur's more positive traits through him kind of going through all of this stuff. But at the same time, it wasn't exactly the most entertaining episode because of that. So, uh, yeah, it kind of falls in the middle to me. I'm a little bit more positive on it, but I don't know how quick I would be to watch it again. This one, I also feel like we're going we're gonna to differ sharply on this one. Uh, talking about the Great Sock Mystery helped me to appreciate it a bit more. And I want to say, no matter again, no matter what I think about it, I'm really happy when Arthur gets offbeat. When it gets, like, when we just get these concepts that you can't get on any other show... Uh, and they just decide to get weird with it. It's I like the weird. It's not always going to work for me personally, but I like that general trend. This episode, not crazy about it personally. Um, the it's very it's very humor based. I found found that a lot of the humor didn't work for me personally. I thought that uh, the kind of sock market and the fur masons thing was really odd. Not necessarily in a negative way, but I was like just trying to wrap my head around it for most of the episode and i was just like okay this is oh, this is wild see, I'm, I'm just my my i'm just tr- my dog will is is already out there disagreeing with you you can hear him you can hear him barking away he knows something me and you <laughs> don't maybe about the fur base it's just a second i'm gonna close the door uh, okay uh basically uh, for the for the sake of for the sake of spirit i will i will keep it brief in saying that this is not my favorite episode i'm still not really a great fan of the Kate and Pal episodes, which is too bad because I back. did used, I did used to like them quite a bit, but uh, yeah, it's it's it, hopefully this episode's an indicator of a trend to come, and uh, I'm open to more Kate and Pal episodes. I hope to be convinced as the series goes on. Uh, Lucas, I have a feeling you could not disagree more. Yeah, I love this episode. I this uh, <laughs> people were saying this season gets up to a rocky start. I'm like, this is insane and I'm along for the ride. But it's also again, I this is the drum I've been beating this whole time. Um, I love world building and stuff, right? Like I've talked about it before about like why I like Naruto, why I understand why pe- people like things like Harry Potter and stuff like that. Like if you um give me like this society or this culture and just explain how it operates. So all this stuff with Kate and Pal, like, put this episode against the secret life of, like, what is it called? The Dogs and dogs and Babies? Secret Life of, of Dogs. Secret Life of Dogs and dogs Babies. Dogs and Babies. Yep. I like this episode so much more than I like that episode. Like, that episode is very much like, oh, it's kind of like Arthur's answer to Stewie Griffin and Brian the dog. This episode is much less about Pal and Kate's characterization and more about, like, the society of the animals that live under the Arthur characters. And I was along for the ride. And also I felt the Huber really did work for me. Like, I feel like it's been a while since I've, um, everybody knows I do my little thing at the end of the episode where I say the quote. And lately I feel like I've been having trouble. I'll have one or two to choose from this episode from like my foot's cold, a raccoon or a tibble. What's a steak out without donuts? Uh, Come on, baby, he's not even your species. Like, I, a lot of the humor really did hit with me. Um, and it's just so high concept. And I don't know, like, I'm a big fan of this episode. And also, because I didn't know where it was going, I was at the edge of my seat the whole time. I was like, really? Where is this episode going next? Pal's like, I guess I'll play the sock market. I'm like, what? This is this episode turned into, like, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross for, like, a quick second. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I totally understand why... It doesn't work for you, and I also understand that like you really aren't haven't been a fan of the Pal and Kate episodes in general. Uh, mm-hmm. But for me, like the first one was like okay, and I was like okay, this is gimmicky. But how many times could they do this? And I was ready to kind of not like this episode at the start because I was like, oh wow, we're really going back to this this well already. Uh, but boy, howdy, I loved the Great Sock Mystery. <laughs> I'm glad you did. And like I said, I'm open to the episode surprising, these types of episodes surprising me. So um, I look forward to the next one. So hopefully my opinion can improve. 
And that's going to do it. We have begun Season 7. We've cracked it open, and uh, we're ready to dig in and see more. Uh, a lot of the emails that we got this week have me excited uh, for what's coming up next. And uh, as well, don't forget, over on our Patreon, patreon.com slash Limits, this month, our patrons will be getting a review of Detective Pikachu. So, Lucas, uh, we're probably going to have to see that separately, I'm guessing, yeah? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, it'd be nice if we could see it together. Well, me and you will talk off pod about yeah, for uh, sure. I, uh, the schedule. Don't get me wrong. I, yeah, don't get me wrong. I would love to see it with you. Mm. Uh, but uh, we, we, we'll, 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 we will see about that. Uh, in the meantime, coming up on the next full episode of Elwood City Limits, we're going to be talking about Francine's split decision and Muffy goes metropolitan. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Well, we're going to have to see what surprises, uh, surprises indeed that Season 7 has for us. I feel like the first episode really dropped quite a few on us, and I feel like there's more to come. So I'm excited, and I hope you are too, Lucas. Oh, I'm... Buddy, am I ever. Season 7, here we come. All right. That's going to do it for Elwood City Limits this week. Thank you very much for listening, and hope you have a great rest of your week. My name is Will Young, and for Lucas Mancini. Hmm. I really shouldn't have just listed all the quotes uh, right before we do this. <laughs> I kind of put myself in a, in a corner. Uh, I think I'll go with uh, <laughs> DW who? <laughs> Always a good one. Oh, poor DW. <laughs> All right. We'll see you next time.